Thank you. So whilst I'm waiting for the clicker, thanks for coming. Um, the picture they chose is about 20 years old, so uh, apologies if I'm not the guy that you see on that picture. I do remember those days, but <laughs> it was a long time ago. Um, so thank you very much for the introduction. So Cryptarium, um, you'll be pleased we're not going to do a presentation about an ICO that we're about to do because we've done the ICO. What I want to talk about today is why we did the ICO and what our purpose is and what, what we're trying to achieve. And our vision is relatively straightforward. To be able to make cryptocurrency something that the whole world uses, you have to turn the cryptocurrency into a money, money that people can spend. And most of you in this room probably, well, maybe not probably, but many of you will have never actually spent a cryptocurrency. You might own some cryptocurrency, but probably you've never spent any cryptocurrency. And we want to change that. And therefore, we ran the ICO. The ICO's vision, I think, was what made it a success. Our idea is simple, to be able to spend your cryptocurrency in a real-world environment. Some of the um, numbers um, our host gave us was a little bit off, but what was key was that we did have an incredible success rate in terms of the number of people who bought our tokens. I think that was because our message is very simple. Wouldn't it be great if you could actually spend this stuff that everyone calls a currency? Okay, so you're probably going to get a lot of data over the next two days, so I'm not going to bore you with a lot of data, but data does put things into perspective. So I just want to give a few bullet points out there. How many people are actually transacting with cryptocurrency on a daily basis? Ranges from three to five million, depending on who you ask. Probably most of that three to five million, however, are crypto to crypto. Very few of them are actually crypto to any form of fiat transaction. But the predict predictions for the future are quite significant. People are talking about 10% of world GDP, hundreds of millions of crypto owners. How do we get there, though? That's the big question. And I've put a little chart on the bottom what the total market cap was a couple of days ago, about 350 billion. It sounds like a big number, but it's actually not a very big number. Let's have a look at where crypto fits in the world scale of money right now. So each of those little red blocks that you can see represent about $100 billion. Sounds like a lot of money, $350, $400 billion. But if you put it into perspective, if you compare it with Apple, it's about half the size of Apple's valuation, a little bit less. It's about 25% of the valuation of the 50th richest people on the planet. So we don't even match the 50 top people on the planet in the crypto space. The next set of boxes is cash, cash and coins that are in circulation. That's roughly about 5%. And then if you look at it as a percentage of world total money, crypto right now is still incredibly small. It's not this big thing that's taking over the world. It's actually quite small. And in fact, it's only less than a half a percent of the world money supply right now. Two months ago, it was about a percent. But as you know, crypto is very volatile. So now it's half a percent of the world money supply. But what that says is we're really just at the beginning. So all of this hype about Bitcoin and the price um, rises and, and falls, etc., this is only the start of it. So whether the Bitcoin is going to be 10,000, 20,000, 5,000, it won't really matter in the total scheme of things because crypto is still in its infancy. But crypto has an opportunity to change the world. And I really do mean change the world. Right now, there are approximately 2 billion people that are unbanked. There's actually, I, I read 11 million people in America, adults, that cannot get bank accounts. You know, it's not a small number of people in America, but on a global level, 2 billion people don't have bank accounts. If you don't have a bank account, you can't transact in the real world environment. You can't do business across borders. You can't do internet transactions. In Asia alone, if you ignore China, 650 million people, only 50 million of them have bank accounts. That's 600 million people in Asia that don't have bank accounts. But crypto can change that for them. Crypto, once it becomes accepted as a money, can change that for them. Those people are not necessarily 
um, let's say, the poorest of the planet. They may have many reasons why they do not have a bank account. And if they want to send money from one place to another, we all know what the options are. Western Union is just one of many examples. I'm not picking on Western Union here. But if you are a migrant worker, probably working 15 hours a day, earning $200, $300, and you want to send it home, Western Union, for all their good service, are going to charge you 20% or 15%. It's big fees. They're going to end up being paid of incredibly hard-earned money. But they don't have a choice, these people. They haven't got an option. They can't do a bank transfer because they don't have a bank account. No one wants to give them a bank account. They can't get a bank account. Now, another interesting thing is happening in the world, the mobile phone. The mobile phone, what used to be the, the smartphone. You remember, I don't know if, as I said, my picture was quite an old picture. I don't know if people remember when the first Apple phone came out and how excited you were by seeing the Apple phone. Well, now everyone's got a phone. I mean, my seven-year-old daughter had a smartphone. I mean, who's giving a seven-year-old daughter a smartphone? But I did, and probably many other people in this room are giving you know, smartphones away now like it's confetti. And the price is also coming down. What used to cost $1,000, if you buy a cheap Chinese import, maybe $100 in three years' time, that might be $30. Even that is going to be in the realms of this unbanked population. So we've got all of these people out there who can't get bank accounts and would love to transact in the real world. And we've now started to get technology that will enable them to do some of the things that we can do for granted. And mobile phone usage and how it is being used is very different across the world. First of all, you can see on the left-hand side the predictions of how many mobile phones are going to be sold this year and next year. It's roughly 1.5 billion phones. In addition to those 1.5 billion phones that are sold, there's probably already another 5 billion phones out there. Everybody on the planet effectively can get themselves a mobile phone. On the right-hand side, what this is showing is mobile money accounts. And by this, I don't mean Apple Pay or Samsung Pay. I'm talking about people that are using the mobile phone accounts to pay bills. So they pay the equivalent in Africa of AT&T, whatever the leading provider is in Africa. They put $20 onto their account, and they can use their AT&T account in Africa to make a payment for something else. And as you can see in Africa, at the top one there, roughly 100 million people are making payments with their mobile phones just using a standard smartphone to make a very simple contract. And the, the, the um, growth rates are very significant. Now, when you get down to the bottom, Europe, of course, people don't need it so much. Most of the people in Europe have bank accounts. They don't need these facilities. But there's a huge group of people out there that does. And when mobile phone payments start to take over, the speed of transition can be astronomically fast. Everybody, I'm sure everybody in this room has heard of WeChat and Alipay. WeChat and Alipay dominate all Chinese commerce now. 63%, this, this is just one of many examples I could have given. It was done by Deutsche Bank, so it compares data with Germany, not the US, just because it's Deutsche Bank. But you can see 63% of all transactions that included um, clothing were in China last year went through the WeChat or the Alipay payment app on a mobile phone. It totals for the whole of China about $5 trillion compared to the USA of roughly $110 billion, 50 to 1 ratio. So once the mobile phone payment concept takes over, and of course China was one of those countries where people didn't have bank accounts, weren't able to get bank accounts, so as a result, it is taking over. Now, the advantages of cryptocurrency, we're all here. We all believe in cryptocurrency. We all think it's got a future. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. And the advantages are quite clear. No borders, low fees, potentially 100 times faster in its speed. And of course, a Bitcoin or any form of cryptocurrency is the same price in the US as it is in Nicaragua or Nigeria or India doesn't really matter. It's the same price everywhere. No longer do you have to move money into a hard currency, spend it over, then take it back out, lose 10, 15% in the process. It has lots of advantages. So why are people not using it to transact on a daily basis? 
because people are not using it on a daily basis. We call it a currency, but nobody is really spending it. Now, yes, we've got security, we've got low cost, we've got speed, but on the right-hand side, and you could put your own list here, this is just me throwing out you know, a number of reasons. On the right-hand side, it's complex. You try and explain Bitcoin to your mum, you'll be there a long time before she understands it. Um, it's not that easy to get hold of. I mean, you've, these um, exchanges, very professional, but that's the problem, they're very professional. If you're, again, my mum, and you go on an exchange, you take one look at it and come straight back off it. It's not that easy. People don't trust it yet. Um, also, there's not that much awareness. People have heard of Bitcoin. How many people have heard of Dash or Ripple or any of the other currencies that are, are out there? Very few people. But I think one of the key things I want to highlight is volatility. How can anybody price in a cryptocurrency today when that's the volatility for the last seven days? It's an 18.5% swing. And if you've got one of these apps that I've got on my phone and you're regularly checking what your wallet balance looks like, well, it goes up and down quite significantly every couple of minutes. You know, if you check every minute, you've either made a thousand, you've lost a thousand. You know, it's, these are big swings. So you can't expect a store to price in cryptocurrency. And secondly, which cryptocurrency? You know, there are so many of them. So how are they going to price? And what I find is quite ironic the reason people buy most cryptocurrencies is they believe it is going to become a digital currency of the future, but the very fact of buying it and selling it is actually stopping it from being that because it's so volatile. So it's actually quite an ironic situation we find ourselves in. So how do we get from, you want to pay with what, did you say, sir, to actually saying that's no problem. We can take that currency, it's really not a problem. Now you can't expect to go from where we are today to that position in just one step. It's gonna be a many steps. Now, we can move a lot of the things onto the left-hand side. We can move the simplicity, the convenience. They will all come better over time. I think volatility is gonna stick there for a long time. Unfortunately, we're gonna to have to live with the volatility for quite a long time. But what is important to me is the number and the volume of digital currencies that people are actually gonna get access to. Now, this chart just shows Bitcoin as a percentage of the total crypto market. Of course, when it, 2015, it was the, the only real cryptocurrency out there. Now it's about 40% of the market. And the thing that Cryptarium believes in is not that Bitcoin is going to be this thing that's going to change the world. It's actually this box that I name other that is what's going to change the world. Because Bitcoin, as I said, it's complex. Not everybody understands it. Um, it's not that easy to access. But the other is actually going to change that. Now, some of you will have seen the chart I'm about to show. It's a video. It's a very clever video. I cut off the first. Oops, maybe I can go back. I was hoping. Guys, can you play the video for me at the back? There we go. So what you can see now is the altcoins, the alt tokens. Now, again, forgive me if you've seen this, this video. I missed off the first two years. It doesn't really add much. There was not much happening in the first two years. But this is the other box that was really quite critical. Lots of ICOs out there all creating their own individual um, tokens. But most of those tokens have a utility value. They are being created for a specific purpose. Now, this is the explosion that has taken place in the last, effectively, six months. So we are at the start of something very, very big. Um, there's some big names in there. Some of you may have bought tokens within those big names. But why do I show this? It's because these are the things that your mum, your dad, my son, my daughter, may well end up owning, not because they went out to buy cryptocurrency as some form of investment, but because it has a utility purpose that they want. And I'm gonna give one example. Playchip. Playchip is probably a, an ICO that you don't know. I mention it because I think it's got the potential to be the biggest, um, let's see, ICO that is going to impact people um, in the next few months. Now, we've done an alliance with Playchip. The, uh, their tokens will be on our platform. But why am I excited by Playchip? Playchip is in the gaming industry. Now, almost every conference you'll go to, 
there will be gamers out there that are talking about how they're going to move what is already a digital currency inside the gaming environment into a cryptocurrency that you can buy and sell on exchanges. Now, gaming industry has hundreds of millions of users. This particular company, Playchip, is working with um, enthusiasts um, gaming, and they have 100 million discrete users every single month. Now, those users, when they want to play on this platform, will have to buy the Playchip token. No longer will they just be buying their equivalent of Candy Crush tokens to get a few free lives. They'll be buying Playchip tokens. And those tokens will move between platform to platform. But every gamer eventually wants to cash out. It's the same with loyalty programs. Now, the loyalty program of yesterday was only use it on the one airline. Now, today, we know that those um, loyalty programs, you can buy luggage, you can maybe buy them a, a theme park ride, you can do all sorts with them. But the next evolution is that they become digital tokens that people can spend either in that environment or they can exchange them. So what is going to happen in the next 18 months, two years, is all these people who right now do not understand what a cryptocurrency is or how it works are actually going to start to own some because they have a utility purpose on another, on another company. Now, I can carry on about Playchip. It's not so important to, to talk about its features, but there are video websites out there that are going to now pay you in cryptocurrency for uploading content, gaming websites that are going to pay you to play games, survey websites that are going to pay you in crypto to do a survey. And the list goes on and on and on. And all of these are cryptocurrencies. So when you combine mobile technology, which pretty much everybody can afford and will work, with utility nature tokens that everybody on the street will actually start to own, not because they went out as an investor, but because they happened to shop at Sears or they happened to play a game online, they've got $20, $30 worth of cryptocurrency in their pocket. And then you integrate that with an existing payment infrastructure, we have the Visa, we have the MasterCard, we have the um, Union Pay in China. Um, I list two here, which we are integrating with, Lukova um, up in Canada and Liquid Pay in Asia. Liquid Pay, for example, has 500,000 payment terminals across Asia. And you'll be able to use our application on their payment terminals to spend this cryptocurrency that people will be acquiring. Combine those three things together. And suddenly, cryptocurrency starts to have a real-world use. So how do we do it? So what we enable you to do as a customer, and we're not the only one, there will be others out there, but we will be the first that can actually do it the way I'm presenting. What we will enable you to do is, through your mobile phone, to be able to spend all those currencies that I've just talked about in a real-world environment. So you start off with your digital wallet. Nothing particularly clever about this digital wallet. It's a digital wallet. Um, it has your cryptocurrency in it. Um, you use your mobile phone. You go to Starbucks, and you go to Starbucks with your mobile phone, and Starbucks says, that's $5 for your coffee. You touch your phone to the terminal, and you say, I'd like to pay in play chip tokens, please. Now, if you said that to Starbucks, they're going to laugh at you. But you don't need to say that, because we are going to do the process behind the scenes. Starbucks doesn't want play chip, doesn't want Bitcoin, it wants $5. And that's what the terminal will ask for. Now, as with any payment transaction, it will go to a bank. The bank that issued the payment card, or, for example, in Liquid Pay, the payment um, point of sale platform. And the bank will say, well, we don't know. We'll ask Cryptarium, should we authorize this or not? Now, Cryptarium is constantly measuring how much your wallet has in fiat currency, whether that be dollar, euro, rupee, it doesn't really matter. So we're constantly valuing it, and we know to say yes or no. If we say yes, then we actually use fiat currency. We have a fiat currency pool of money that will pay MasterCard, the bank issuer, $5. And the bank pays $5 to Starbucks. It's a very simple process. Now, inside this, of course, we are buying and selling crypto assets from the customer. But the customer is actually doing a transaction in real time in Starbucks, and Starbucks receives money. Now, the other thing we do is we are able to avoid the fees. Not all of the fees, but most of the fees. 
If you've ever done a Bitcoin transaction, you know it costs roughly between three and ten dollars, depending on the day you use it. So no one's going to spend five dollars for five dollars coffee and then pay another five dollars on top for the transaction. But we do basically a master account, and we scrape all the accounts at once, and we do one five dollar transaction. We don't do five thousand five dollar transactions, so we effectively eliminate the fee for the purposes of the customer. Now, for this, we do charge the customer a small fee, half a percent, in our token. But ultimately, it's a very small price to pay to be able to use that cryptocurrency that you got when you played on the game in Starbucks or McDonald's. So ultimately, it's a fiat-to-fiat -fiat transaction, and we have obviously a bid-offer um, element to it. The more volatile the currency, the bigger the bid-offer spread is going to be. The lower the volatility, the lower that spread will be. So it's actually a very simple process. Now, the technology behind it is not simple, but for you as a customer, the process is actually quite simple. You tap your phone, Starbucks says five bucks, you pay with Playchip, and the whole deal is done. So I'm gonna wrap up now. Um, just what is the purpose of this presentation? The purpose is to explain how we are going to go from $350 billion worth of crypto money into an environment where it is real money in a real world situation where your mom and dad and your kids and your auntie and uncle and everybody's got some crypto and they have a way to spend it. So everyday people start to use tokens in a real world environment. We will all get some at some point, even if we didn't understand how we got them. Token owners will look for ways to actually spend that token outside the environment. As the same way with the Ermiles programs had to move out of just buying flights to being able to buy bottles of wine or whatever else, it'll be exactly the same here. I may have $100 worth of a particular store's token, but I don't want to go back to that store. I'd quite like to spend it on the meal that I'm doing tonight. No problem, we can actually do that conversion. And people will start to look for ways to spend it. The more tokens are used and spent, the more people will feel comfortable with it. If I know I can spend a token, then I'm also relaxed about receiving a token. Now, of course, the exchanges will create different values, etc. But today, if I said to you, can I pay you in Bitcoin? You might say, okay, I know exactly how much of a Bitcoin is worth, but it's still a hassle. But if I said to you of one of those other 1,500 tokens out there, you're probably gonna say no. But if you know you can spend it, then you might say yes. So our simple logic is we are not waiting for the world to accept Bitcoin or Ripple or Dash or whatever is going to be the big winner out there in the crypto world to take over and people starting to get their salaries in Bitcoin. We are expecting and almost certain that almost everybody who has any form of real world transactions is going to start to own crypto and they're going to want to spend it. And once you can start to spend it, then it starts to have a general level of acceptance, and that's what we do. Okay, that's it. I am finished. I'm happy to take any questions, or I'm also happy to sit down and let someone else speak. Yes? Can you speak a bit louder? Sorry, it's a long way. That is a very good point. I mean, of course, if something is cre um, treated as a security. Okay. So the question was, if the cryptocurrency is counted as a security, then how are you actually solving the um, trading elements of actually now trading in a security rather than actually trading in a currency? Now, that is a very good point. Now, obviously, we have a more expert person coming up on the stage directly after me who might well answer this question a lot better than I'm going to answer it. But not every token will be counted as a security. If it is a security, then probably we will stay clear of it to start with. Now, what makes it a security, unfortunately, is a little bit unclear right now. And also, everybody in this room is probably only thinking about the USA, because you're in the USA. We're not just thinking of the USA, we're also thinking of every other market in the world. So Japan, for example, treats it as currency. Singapore has come out recently and said it's gonna treat it as, as currency. China 
who knows what's going to happen with China? They may come out and say it's a currency or a security. But clearly, not every single crypto token or cryptocurrency is going to be counted as a security. Now, if it is a security, of course, there's a whole new world that we have to live in. But until that world is made clear, we're still going to go down this path and be careful which ones we pick. We won't allow 2,000 tokens on our platform. We will only allow those tokens which we believe fit with our um, environment. First of all, it has to be liquid. It has to sit on three or four exchanges. Um, and it has to have, in our opinion, a utility value that is actually adding some real world. So it's a good question, but until we have clarity from the SEC and other markets, then we can't answer it, unfortunately. Yes, at the back. Okay, the, it's not really the customer that needs to worry about it, it's more the bank issuer that needs to worry about it. So what we have is this process whereby we have a virtual Visa card or a virtual MasterCard or a virtual UnionPay card, doesn't matter, inside the digital wallet. And that virtual card has a zero balance. It's got zero balance. It's not that we're putting a 3,000 credit card in there, it's a zero balance card. When the transaction goes to Starbucks and it goes to the bank, the bank knows it's a zero balance card. So they will check two things simultaneously. They will check first with us that we are prepared to authorize the payment. And secondly, there is a fiat settlement account that sits inside that bank. So the bank knows when they authorize it, the money is sitting there for them to actually recover their cost. So from a issuing perspective, the bank has two checks. One, Cryptarium says yes, and two, the money is sitting there. And the bank can withdraw that money from the fiat settlement account either instantaneously or more likely at the end of every single day. Now, for the customer, we have a smart contract. And effectively, what we do is we do two transactions at the same time, although from a legal perspective, one is before the other. And the one that's before the other is we say to you as a customer, we would like to buy some crypto from you. And we'd like to buy crypto worth $5 worth of the crypto that you are interested in selling. And we make that purchase. And we put a smart contract marker on your account that says $5 of your crypto that you were happy to sell to us now belongs to us. So we have security that we, we own that. We also know that we wouldn't authorize it unless you had enough money. And the bank has security that the uh, fiat currency is sitting there. So everybody in this process has basically some form of level of security. The only let's say, risk in this equation is that two or three minutes that we will be living with in the exchange between the crypto and the fiat currency on some form of an exchange. And that's why we have to have a bid offer spread. Um, in the same way any other bank will detect on money laundering. I mean, actually, I mean, this is a common question, but um, what we are doing is we're allowing people to use a mobile phone in a Starbucks. Now, maybe money laundering will be used to buy Starbucks coffee, but I think it's much more down at another end of the equation. So our cards are zero balance cards. They're not going to be for buying a Ferrari or buying a house. They're buying for you know day-to-day -day transactions. So we have, as an advanced to KYC and AML procedures, as any leading bank today. Um, you know, if you've been to any of these conferences, there are many companies out there that are doing fantastic work. We do all that up front, and then, as I say, we're in, in a real-world environment, okay, maybe there's money laundering for a coffee or a TV, but it's you know, the type of business that we're aiming at. We're not aiming at the million-dollar transactions. We're aiming at the $10, $20 daily transactions. So. Yep, yourself. Yes? You know, that that's really is a good question, but it's not actually one I can answer for you right now because, of course, data is in the press right now because of Facebook and all those other things um, taking place. Um, we have been, let me, I, I didn't explain. We were a payments platform before we became Cryptarium. So we, we've been working with um, fiat currency payments for the last four years. We do transactions on every single day. We did, I think, 400,000 transactions last year on a, a, using a, a payments platform. 
We do not use that data at this point in time for anything other than confirming the customer and the payment. So we're not using, let's say, this metadata that we could be using. How we use it in the future is going to be really governed, I think, by what is acceptable use um, by the marketplace. Now, we will own data because we see the transaction. And we will also have data on a particular um, chip. How we use that, we have never really given it much thought. We don't see it as being a monetization issue for us. We only see it as a um, means to better, let's say, target the right customer base. But it, it really is a fantastic question, but we have no intention right now of using it for monetary purposes. Yeah, what, what we offer um, the customer is different pricing strategies, or not, let's say payment strategies. So if you go on various exchanges, depending on the volatility of the currency, you're going to have a swing between 5 and minus 5%. Now, Bitcoin probably is within half a percent each direction, but some of these other tokens may well have significant swings. So that's why we need to be on three or four exchanges. So we can't work with a token that is only on one exchange. Um, in fact, we are about to be a token that is only on one exchange when we launch on HitBTC on Monday. But we will launch on other, to on other exchanges because our customers need to buy our tokens to use our platform. So you have to have a utility nature to the token. And in our opinion, if you have a utility nature of the token, you can't just be on one exchange. You have to be on a whole range of exchanges. You can't limit the customer. So we have built, well, we're working with a third party right now to build algorithms that reflect both the volatility and the liquidity of the token. Um, now, you as a customer can say, I would like to mix my tokens in a purchase. I'd like a little bit of um, play chip and a little bit of Bitcoin. And I want it in the following ratios dependent on pricing strategies. So what we confirm to the customers, we will not be further away than the average by some mathematical mean. But for us as a company, the average actually gives us an opportunity to cover our risk. So let's say you as an individual, you can get a dollar price, and that's the fixed average, but we might be able to get it for a dollar five or sell it for 95. And we do that. So we give you effectively the average, which is fair market price, and then within the volatility, we take advantage of the difference. Yes, sir, at the back. Now, we will have servers in every single country that we operate. So we, many countries have all sorts of rules. Now, the predecessor to us, as I said, is a payments system called PayQR. PayQR is one of the leading payment platforms in Russia. People will look at that and say, oh, well, it's Russia. Maybe it's, it's got more you know, risk. Actually, there's less risk, because the rules you have to apply in Russia are tighter than almost anywhere else, because the whole world watches Russia. So if you're doing a payments platform in Russia, your anti-money laundering and all these things have to be perfect. And also, you have to make sure the data doesn't flow outside the country, and it has to sit in certain locations. So we will follow those rules on a country-by-country -country basis. Now, I want to... Um, say that what I've presented today isn't yet live. We don't go live for two months. So the question you're asking is, how will we do it, um, and rather than how do we do it? And as I say, we will make sure that we are containing the information within the boundaries that that particular country allows us to do. And every country is different. I mean, the UK is, allows you to do it around Europe, for example, whereas the US and Russia will have completely different rules. Is that it? My time is up, sorry, guys. Um, I have no problems with people get, taking a copy of the deck if, it's, okay. if it, it can be distributed. So what we will do after the show is we can collect decks from any presenters that agree for release, and we'll put them up and send you all links so you can download them to make it easy. Let's give a round of applause to thank Austin Kim. Thank, thank you, you guys. very much. Thank you, everyone. Um, can you, um, Austin?